take comfort from the fact that the pilot plan was not rolled out across the country. I just want to argue what kind of a victory does it represent when many of our women are now really scared to walk the streets. Um, they're scared of leaving their homes. They're scared of going to their temples because we've just heard that in the Gurdwaras, in the Sikh temples, they have now uh, put UKPA officials uh, ostensibly to provide advice to anybody who voluntarily wants to return. But in fact, the, the word on the ground is that they're acting as spies to winkle out any illegals because that is where illegal where people who are impoverished, they are fed. You know, Gurdwara has a tradition of providing food, free food to people who come there. So that is your perfect place if you want to find out who's uh, illegal. To, um, and, and the Sikh, at least one of the institutions in South Hall have agreed to have a UKBA official um, situated there. So, so, and then we've got this other thing that's going on, you know, in Birmingham, they've got this pilot plan where uh, landlords are going to be checking on the immigration status of their tenants, and this is going to be rolled out across the country if it's successful. And that means that our women uh, who use our services have even made a difference is finding accommodation. So what's happening is that the borders are closing in on us and they're really suffocating our communities. And despite the fact that we have taken aspects of the immigration legislation and fought very hard, we've not, with every success we've had, we've had you know, a huge number of drawbacks. So and that's something I want to talk about now. Um, I mean, it's, the immigration system has been used to divide us, not just black from white, but within our own communities. And what I referred to in my three-minute presentation was this issue of uh, advancing gender equality at the expense of the rest of the community, the expense of racial uh, inequality, growing racial inequality. And I'll explain how that happens. So for example, when we ask the state to support us on forced marriages, we ask for things like resources, refuges, you know, better training for teachers, social workers, police, and police officers to pick up on these things, they often respond by immigration legislation. So they had, for example, they changed the, um, the rule uh, where you were marrying a foreign spouse, an overseas spouse, the age limit went up from 18 to 21. So that was real, we, we argued that was a, you know, a blanket ban, it was racial discrimination. And what happened was it was challenged in court by a British woman who was 17 years old who wanted to marry her 19-year-old Chilean uh, national. And she succeeded, and that was overturned, and so that's no longer. But what I'm, I'm just giving you that as an example of how that one bit of legislation that, which we would anyway argue would not really help first marriage cases because women can be taken back to their countries of origin, they wait till they're old enough, they still get them married off and bring them back to this country. So it, didn't, it wouldn't really have dealt with the issue of forced marriage, but for the government, it's about how do we reduce numbers. Um, so, and, so, and then the other big campaign that we have run, which we ran for 20 years, I tell you, I mean, it's, it's such a small part of the immigration system, and that was the one-year rule. Um, it was a probationary period for foreign ma for marriages to overseas nationals. So any marriage to an overseas national had to last for a year. If it broke down within that period, the woman would be deported. So the, 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 the this choice, the stark choice for the woman was domestic violence or deportation. So we fought uh, for this for years and years and years. Finally, we achieved the domestic violence concession, which was if you could provide evidence of domestic violence, you would be allowed to remain in this country. But while you were fighting for that, uh, you were destitute because there was a no recourse to public funds rule. And sometimes these cases would go on, linger on for you know a year or two years. So women were often on the streets. Um, they, were, they would be, end up in religious institutions and be at the mercy of all sorts of people who would exploit them, <coughs> enslave them sexually, etc., as and domestic labor as well. So, um, so we fought against that, and we said that we do need to give benefits. We do need to give access to our women to refuges. We won that in 2012, but at each point, 
So when we won the first domestic violence concession, the probationary period went up from one year to two years. When we won the final um, concession, i.e. there should be uh, access to benefits and resources, the probationary period went up to five years. Now, you know, genuine British weddings, uh, I think on average, break down between two and six years. You know, the marriages don't last, okay? So that is not a sign of how genuine the marriage was in the first place. But these, so what happens is that the whole community gets affected by a small uh, number of cases. So, you know, in 2010, for example, they had issued 40,000 marriage visas. Only 500 women were escaping domestic violence. So something that benefits 500 women, then, because they changed the probationary period to five years, affects 40,000 marriages. You know, it's that kind of gender equality, playing us off women against the, the whole of the community, which we have to be so um, careful about. Um, okay. And of course, uh, people are probably aware of the fact that the other thing they have recently done is that they have uh, increased, um, well, they've set a minimum salary uh, level, income level for people bringing in a foreign dependent. You have to earn 18,600 pounds a year in order to be considered eligible to bring somebody in from abroad. At the same time, our minimum wage is 13,000. So if we can make a living, if, if we can, if people can survive on 13,000, I mean, so there is this kind of discrepancy between what the state says on one, in, on, you know, in different parts of its uh, policy making. And I think those are the sorts of things that we ought to latch on to and bring uh, groups together so that we have the anti-poverty campaigners coming together with the uh, anti-immigration laws campaigners. And, and there are many such discrepancies within uh, state policy that ought to bring us together rather than divide us. This battle on our own and we do need to get involved in the major movements of our times to redraw those links, participate in new movements. Uh, and there's so many movements for transforming democracy from the bottom upwards. We need to fight religious fundamentalism as well as sexual violence and wage inequality and poverty. So this is why I've gone into so much detail about the specific challenges that we face when we are devising a common agenda for change so that we can sign up on the basis of shared values and principles. Okay, thank you.